Praise the Lord. I love that statement. There's something about it when people who know how to use their faith come together to pray. Am I in a room filled with people who know how to use their faith and are ready to pray? Praise God. And I know you are watching. Listen, I have the distinct honor. I count it the highest honor. My name is Holden Hanley. I serve at uh, Kenneth Copeland Ministries, Eagle Mountain International Church as the prayer ministry coordinator. And it's a blast. It's an honor to be able to stand in the gap for Pastor Terry. And listen, Pastor Terry and Pastor George hold such a dear place in my heart. I want to give honor to where honor is due. In fact, my prayer journey began with Pastor Terry. Um, she mentioned it earlier. Whenever I got saved, I got saved in 2000. 2013, I was hungry for the word, but I didn't want to pray because before this point, I just saw prayer. I just saw liturgical prayers. I didn't see any uh, power behind prayer and I didn't know how to see power behind prayer. I was ignorant of the matter, but I went to the Southwest Believers Convention in 2014. Uh, Pastor Terry was doing pre-service prayer in the main arena and the Lord prompted me to go and I'm glad he did because it changed my life forever. And as she was praying, I saw how she, she wasn't led by her emotions in prayer, but she yielded herself to expressions of the Spirit. What do I mean by that? She didn't just get up and pray in a monotone language, but she prayed with fire. She prayed with passion and she allowed the Lord to pray through her on a level that I had never seen. And I was watching her and I said, Lord, if you teach me how to pray like Pastor Terry, I'll never stop praying a day in my life. And he has, and the Lord's blessed me with this to be able to learn from her. And as Brother Creflo says, I preach like my daddy. I want to preach like my mama. Amen. She's an honor and she's a blessing. And I want to give honor to Brother Copeland for this meeting. Have you guys learned something today? Yeah. Listen, I, my, me and my family owe Brother Copeland everything. He's such a blessing to, to us. And a, I, I love my pastors and I love my prophet. Amen. Uh, open your Bibles with me to 1 Timothy chapter 2. And we'll jump right in this. And I want to start uh, where Pastor Terry started. And I want to uh, dig in a little deeper and see. And I want to get to a place of prayer. And, but I want to start here. And that's in 2 Timothy, 1 Timothy, excuse me, chapter 2, starting in verse 1. Some of these things will sound familiar from what we've talked about already with Pastor Terry. But it starts off by saying, Paul says, I exhort you therefore. I was reading this in different translations as I was preparing for this morning. And the Passion Translation says something uh, pretty interesting. It says, and most of all, I write to you because what he's about to say. In other words, this isn't just a suggestion that Paul is doing. This is a demand. He is exhorting you. Some translation says, I beseech you. He says, first of all, I want you to pray... I want all supplication, prayers, intercession, and giving of thanks be made for all men. The Amplified Classic translation says, on behalf of all men. So the objective is to pray on behalf of all men. Now, when you pray on behalf of all men, you can, we don't have a list of the names of everybody, all seven billion people in the world, right? We're not, that's not what he's expecting us to do, but he gives us an example as to how we can pray on behalf of all men by saying this, for kings and for all, say all, that are in authority, whether you like them or not. That was my little add-in right there. Pray for kings and for all that are in authority that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. So that we can live a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. And he says, pray on behalf of all men by praying for kings and for those in our authorities. And as I pray for leaders, as I pray for our governors, as I pray for our president and vice president, when I pray for them, I am touching everybody which they govern. As I pray for the leaders, I am praying for everybody which they govern and who is underneath their tutelage. And I was reading this, and as I said, I, I like reading different translations, but the Passion Translation says something very interesting at the end where the King James says, in life, so we can live quiet and peaceable life and all godliness and honesty. Uh, the Passion Translation says, undisturbed lives uh, to worship the awe-inspiring God undisturbed lives. We've had a lot of disturbance going on within the last year. Amen. And then the Bible gives us a command to tell us that we are to pray for our leaders so that a way the result of that can be an undisturbed life. 
right? As we pray for our leaders, we open up the door for the Lord to come in and have access into these different areas, these different realms of government, and into these different realms of influence so that a way His peace and His governing way of doing things can have access into life. But unless somebody prays, the door's shut for Him to get in. Amen? Going on into verse 3, it says, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Whereunto I am ordained. Paul, the apostle Paul, is ordained a preacher and an apostle. I speak the truth in Christ and lie not, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. Hold your place there. And I want to go back to Ephesians chapter 3. And I want to put our eyes on this again. Paul is saying that he was called an apostle to the Gentiles. Ephesians 3 gives us great insight into what that looked like and how that manifested. If you start in verse 2, the Bible says this, If you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me toward you. The Amplified Classics uh, clarifies that up a little bit there at the end. It says this, stewardship of the grace was given unto me by God so that a way I can dispense it to you for your benefit. In other words, Paul received this grace so that a way through him this grace could be dispensed to us. And through the dispensing of the grace to us, Ephesians 4 gives us insight and says that we are built up. So Paul received this grace, and this grace flowed through Paul to the church. This grace flowed through Paul to the church. You keep on reading, and uh, verse 3 says, "...how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery." Talking about the mysteries. Skip on to verse 5, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and the prophets by the Spirit. Uh, er, earlier in that book, chapter 2 says that you are built upon the foundations of the apostles and the prophets. So now we get to find out what this revelation, what this grace was that was given unto Paul, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ of the gospel. So this grace that Paul received was to bring about revelation that the Gentiles have now been engrafted into this fellowship and engrafted in to be fellow heirs and partakers of the commonwealth of Israel. This had been locked up before. The door was cracked open in Acts chapter 10 with Peter and Cornelius. But Paul took that revelation and flung the door wide open to the fullness of what that is for us. And thank God for it because now we know through Paul that the blessings of Abraham and Deuteronomy 28 are ours. And that, that blessing, Paul absolutely flung the door wide open. And it's a blessing to see that. And I want to show you an example what happened. And I love what Pastor Terry says. She said it best that uh, Paul the Apostle opened the door to this revelation so that we all could walk through it. Paul, an apostle, opened the door to this revelation and gave us access. So an apostle opened the door so that we could see what was on the other side. And once that door was open, everybody else had access to walk right through the door. I'll give you a modern day example of that. I graduated from college at Old Roberts University, and my senior year, uh, I was the teacher's assistant for one of my professors. His name was Dr. Shelton. I loved him. I loved him. He was a charismatic Catholic. Those are awesome people. I love charismatic Catholics. I had, he prayed, we prayed together one time, and this is what he did. He went, that's not something you see every day, but I loved it and I jumped right in. It was amazing. But he was, we got to have some fellowship times my last semester. And he says, so what are you doing after college? I said, I'm believing God to go to Fort Worth and, and work at Kenneth Copeland Ministries. And he said, did you know Brother Copeland changed the body of Christ forever? Brother Copeland changed the body of Christ forever. And in my mind, I was thinking, uh, of course, faith. 
the revelation of righteousness. And I'm, I'm thinking all this to myself. And he clarified what he meant. He said, Brother Copeland opened the door to preaching that Christ is not Jesus' last name. And you guys were honored to hear a piece of that message yesterday if you were in the Partner Service Center about how Christ was not Jesus' last name, but Christ was the anointed one and his anointing. And my, my, my charismatic Catholic professor said that Brother Copeland changed the body of Christ forever with that revelation. So what happened? He was given this revelation, and then the prophet opened the door for everybody else to partake and get access to that same revelation. Yeah. But the apostles and the prophets are the ones who open the door and give everybody else access. And then that dispense is passed down to the pastor, so on and so forth, so that way everybody can be partakers of what the Lord revealed to them. So Paul was received this revelation by the uh, Lord Jesus Christ. And you can see how that fits in to this overarching picture about how the Gentiles have now been engrafted into this family of God. Because right here he's talking about that how it's his will for all men to come into the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And then he goes on in verse 8, and this is where I want to get to. He says, I will therefore that men pray everywhere. Pastor Terry received a word from the Lord, I want prayer everywhere. And it was a strong, it was a stern word. But I would therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. I want you to notice something here. In verse 9, Paul then goes into a different direction. But in this section of Scripture between verses 1 and verses 8 and 1 Timothy chapter 2, Paul opens it with a call to prayer and he ends it with a call to prayer. Paul opens it with a call to prayer and he ends it with a call to prayer. And in verse 8, he says, therefore, and as Brother Hagin says, if you see a therefore in the Bible, find out what it's there for, right? And he says, I would therefore that men pray everywhere. And what are we praying for? We're praying on behalf of all men. We're praying for kings and we're praying for leaders. And we're praying for kings and we're praying for leaders. We're praying for nations. And as we pray for nations, we're praying for the lost. And he gives us, he gives us this command and he gives us this beseeching that men should pray everywhere and pray on behalf. Because as we pray, we open up the door and give the Lord access to have to, to his will will in the earth, in the kings, in leadership, in the White House, in the governor mansion, in the mayors, in all these areas. But the Lord needs somebody to pray. The Lord needs somebody to pray. I'm constantly, and I'm seeing this over and over again in the Bible, I'm constantly amazed at how many times the Lord puts the ball back in our court. I really am amazed by it. You would think that it wouldn't happen as frequently as it did. But whenever God made man and gave him dominion, he meant it. He didn't give him a pseudo dominion and then take it away. It wasn't fake. When God gave man dominion, he gave him dominion and said, be fruitful and multiply, have dominion and subdue it. That wasn't a, that, that, that wasn't a joke in the eyes of God. God gave man dominion and expected him to execute this dominion. As Pastor Terry said, that's the legal side of prayer. And then the vital side is God expected this dominion to be executed through relationship with him. That's the vital side of prayer. And then Paul, or uh, Adam, excuse me, then committed treason, as Brother Copeland says. And then that relationship, that fellowship was then severed. And it, that, that relationship with God was no longer there. But here, Paul is expecting us. He is charging us. I, I would that men pray everywhere. I'm beseeching you that you pray. I'm beseeching you. you we need to be in this together. So Brother uh, John Wesley said this. He says, it seems as though God can do nothing in the earth unless a man prays. Think about that. It seems as though God can do nothing in the earth unless a man prays. So God is calling us to this place beside him to co-labor with him in prayer and to bring about change in the nations, the states, and the lost. Pastor Terry said it this way on Thursday. She said, prayer is being an operative in the kingdom. You have a part to play in the kingdom. You don't just get saved 
and then wait and live your merry life until you get to heaven. No, you're a co-laborer with him. You're an operative. You have a part to play. And one of your number one parts to play is the part of prayer. You are a prayer. The Bible says, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. For all people, you have been engrafted into this house of prayer, and now God is expecting us to be an operative with him in the kingdom and pray to see change come to pass in the earth. And right here in this specific verse, in this specific passage, he's telling us to pray for our leaders, pray for the nation, and pray for the lost. Amen? Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14 says this. In fact, let me put my eyes on it. I encourage you to go do so. It's a very powerful scripture. Second Chronicles, very familiar scripture. Second Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 14. Says this. If my people, say my people. If my people if my people, he's not looking for a whole state. He's not looking for a whole nation. He's just looking for my people. He's looking for his people to become obedient to this call to pray and pray for their leaders like he asked us to in 1 Timothy chapter 2. If my people will humble, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and I will heal their land. So the healing of the land is absolutely directly connected to the prayers of the saints. Amen. To those who are called by the name of the Lord, if we will humble ourselves and pray... God promises us that healing in our land, healing in our states, healing in California, healing in, healing in the United States of America, healing in wherever state that you're or wherever country that you're watching from, healing will take place if my people, that's you, that's me, we have a responsibility to pray and answer this call to prayer to see healing take place in the nation. And it starts with praying for our leaders. So then he goes and talks about praying for our leaders and also talks about praying for the lost. We have a part to play in praying for the lost. You realize that? You have a part to pray in praying for the part to play in praying for the lost. Jesus himself even said it in uh, Matthew chapter 9. He says, I'm, full, I'm, I'm, I'm led by compassion because these people are like a sheep having no shepherd. The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore. Notice how he starts it. Pray ye therefore that the Lord of the harvest will send forth laborers into the harvest. So the laborers are contingent on our prayers. And it's not just pray ye send forth, but if you look at it in the actual Greek, there's an urgency behind it. It says pray ye therefore that the Lord of the harvest will thrust laborers into the harvest. Will thrust them into the harvest. So not only is the nation contingent on our prayers, but the lost are contingent on our prayers. I'll show you an example in the scripture, Acts chapter 2. What led up to the end of Acts chapter 2 with 3,000 people being saved on the day of Pentecost? Where did it start? Chapter 1, they were in the upper room praying. Started with a prayer meeting. Acts chapter 2 started with a prayer meeting. They had been praying for 10 days, nonstop prayer for 10 days. And then all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit comes in like a rushing mighty wind and absolutely bursts through the envelope of this atmosphere and sits on them like a cloven tongues of fire. And as Pastor Terry says, that's not a flick your big lighter. That's a fire more blazing than the sun. And they were baptized with the Holy Ghost and they spoke in other tongues. And then out of that Holy Spirit infusion with power from on high, God didn't fill them with an angel. He filled them with himself. And out of that Holy Spirit infusion came forth Peter, speaking with boldness, with Holy Spirit inspired utterance. Amen. Holy Spirit inspired utterance. That brings us back to what we've been praying about throughout this campaign is utterance. Utterance. Go with me to Ephesians chapter 6. Utterance is everything. You cannot pray for utterance enough. There's always a need for utterance. I told y'all about the example of, of 
Whenever a prophet receives revelation, he needs utterance to bring forth that revelation. He needs utterance. And I want to read this verse in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 18 and 19, and then we'll pray. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints, and for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mysteries of the gospel. Pastor Terry says it this way, utterance is a divine expression leading to a divine release. Amen. Example of that is, I think, I think one of the greatest is Jeremiah. Jeremiah said, the word of the Lord is shut up in me like a fire in my bones. I can't help but let it out. That was a divine expression. It was shut up in him like a fire in his bones. And it was so strong on the inside of him that he couldn't help but release it out. Now, the amazing thing about this word utterance is this word utterance is the Greek word logos. Uh, this is marvelous to me. It's the Greek word logos. And in fact, it's the same Greek word used in John chapter 1 when the Bible says, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And if you wanted to tr use the Greek word, it says, In the beginning was the logos, and the logos was with God, and the logos was God. And then that same Greek word logos is used here for utterance. So that tells me that utterance is more than the right words at the right time to make a good sermon. Utterance is a literal release of God himself into whatever situation you're preaching or praying towards. It is a literal release from the God that is inside of you and giving him access into the areas that you have been designed to give access to. Sister Lynn Hammond words it this way, and I think she says it best. She says, one aspect of prayer is to release God out of your own spirit's deposit. One of the aspects of prayer is to release God out of your own spirit's deposit. The power residing in us is released through prayer. To not pray locks up that power. To not pray locks up that power. We each have an individual responsibility in this call to prayer. You have a sphere of influence that I don't have. I have a sphere of influence that you don't have. But together we can touch the whole world as we touch the areas that God has given us. This is the body of Christ coming together. And whenever the body of Christ answers this call to prayer, this whole world will be blanketed with prayer. This whole world will be blanketed in prayer. Brother Copeland says that this, every success is a prayer success. Every failure is a prayer failure. Prayer is everything. Prayer is the foundation for every successful Christian endeavor. So we have just a couple more minutes left. I want you all to stand up and we're going to enter into this place of prayer. But I want to say something that was on my heart. Pastor Terry talked really uh, a lot this past uh, pre-service prayer times about the, our position of prayer, our platform of prayer. We pray from a position of love, and we always, 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 I need, listen to me, we always, always, always pray from the victory side. You are not subject to anything but God Himself. No situation are you secondary to. No matter what the situation is, whether it's in the state, whether it's in the government, whether it's in the nation, whether it's in your own personal life, whether it's in the ministry, whether it's in fill in the blank, you are not second to it. It is second to you. In fact, the Bible says that it is under your feet. So when we pray, we have the divine privilege to pray from the victory side because God Himself through Jesus has opened up the veil and given us access to the right hand of God. You have been given access to the right hand of the most authoritative seat in the universe. And it's from that position we pray. We don't pray from a place of lesser than. We pray from a place of everything being subject to us. Everything being subject to the anointing and the name of Jesus and the blood of Jesus and the Word of God. And we yield ourselves as vessels to that place and release God out of our own spirit's deposit. Amen. So I had two things specifically that I, I believe was directed of the Lord to pray about tonight. Um, and we'll let them unfold as the Lord leads. But first off is I wanted to pray for the prayers. I wanted to pray for the prayers. And then I wanted to continue on and pray for utterance. 
So I want you guys to, 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 to link in with this. Join in and bring your supply. You have a supply, and I want to go, and I want to start praying in the Spirit. So, Father, I want to hear you guys. Oh, Father, I want to hear you guys. Oh, Father, I want to hear you guys. Oh, Father, we come boldly unto the throne of grace. We come boldly unto the throne of grace that you've given us access to. You have given us access to a front row seat of the Lord of Lord and the King of Kings and caused us to sit in the seat that he sits in. So, Father, from the place that you have given us in the Spirit and our fellowship with you, we allow you to flow through us and release your power into the lives of the prayers. Father, I pray for those that have been standing for California. I pray for those that have been standing for the nation. I pray for those that have been standing for the states that they they reside in. Father, I pray for those that have been sta- that, that have been praying for the countries that they reside in. And Father, right now, I hold them before you in the Spirit, and I thank you that you are strengthening them in their inner man and causing them to be reinforced with mighty power. Oh, they've been standing for a long time, Father, and you know how long they've been praying, and you know how long they've been interceding. But Lord, I thank you that you are bringing about a mighty move, and a prayer of faith never goes unanswered. A prayer of faith never goes unanswered. A prayer based on the Word of God, and a prayer as led by the Spirit never goes unanswered. So Father, I thank you right now that you are giving them utterance on a higher order. I thank you that you're giving them utterance to pray on a higher level than they thought possible to pray. Father, I thank you that you're giving them eyes to see exactly how they're to pray over their current situation. Father, I thank you that you're giving them eyes over into the Spirit. I thank you that you're giving them eyes over into the supernatural. I thank you that you're giving them eyes over into the realm where they haven't seen. But Father, I thank you that with their prayers is being infused with wisdom. Wisdom is being infused with their prayers, and they are praying and in accordance to how you see it. For Lord, they are viewing things from a higher vantage point. Oh my. Yes, they are viewing things from a higher vantage point. Oh, they are viewing things from the right hand of the Father. They are not viewing things no longer from here on earth, but Father, they are viewing things from their position of victory. They are viewing things from their position of authority. They are viewing things from their position of power and might, and they are executing that power into the earth. They are executing that power into the states. They are executing that power into the nations. They are executing that power into into their, into their ministries, into their lives, and into their families, oh God. Oh, when we magnify you for it. Oh, and we thank you for the utterance to undo the strategies of the devil. We thank you for utterance to undo the strategies of the devil. We thank you for utterance to undo the strategies of the wicked one. We thank you for utterance to undo the strategies and, es- and, and, and usher in the glory. Usher in the glory. Utterance that brings about miracles. Utterance that brings about signs. Utterance that brings about the glory. Utterance that brings about praise. Utterance that brings about dis- demonstrations and a move of God utterance that opens the door to the awakening of America. Oh yes, utterance that opens the door to the awakening of America. Utterance that opens the door to the awakening of America in their prayers. And Father, I pray for Brother Copeland tonight. Oh yes, I pray for the prophet. I pray for the prophet. I pray that he will have utterance to open his mouth boldly, to bring forth the revelation and the mysteries that you have put in his inner man, that you have revealed to him personally, Father. I thank you that you are accompanying those, re- those revelation with utterance to bring them forth, to open up new doors to new realms that we didn't know possible. Oh, new places in the Spirit, new heights in the Spirit. Oh, Father, I thank you for utterance for him as he preaches. Oh, I thank you for strength. Oh, recebre es dobre e baba oketle. And we magnify you. Just begin to praise the Lord. Oh, we magnify you for him. We magnify you for the gift that's on him. We magnify you for the words that you put in him. Oh, and we magnify for what you're doing tonight in this place. Oh, and we glorify you and we praise you in the name of Jesus. Thank you all for your supply. Are y'all ready for a powerful night? Oh, come on. Are y'all ready for a powerful night? 
Praise God, praise God. It was a joy to be with you. Amen.